Hi. Sorry, it's been a minute. Hi, hello. How are you? Nice to see y'all again. I'm kinda in a studio transition right now, but there will be content this summer, I think. So a bit of history. On June 10th, 2013, I purchased my first drum kit. It was kind of flimsy, a sound percussion kit used from Guitar Center that uh, ran me about $183 with two cymbals added. At this point, I was only playing poorly at open mics and this kit gave me the opportunity to work out a lot of ideas and grooves at home and also gave me the opportunity to finally practice and like connect with the fundamentals of drumming i actually use that very kit in a lot of my earlier videos and it's a little hard to believe that i started this journey over a decade ago and the myriad of changes that have occurred in how i approach drumming in regards to then and how i do it now through my love and appreciation for drumming, I've been able to travel, play interesting and diverse stages, but most importantly, learn so much about myself. And I'd like to share some of those things with you. So here are 10 things I've learned from my 10 years of drumming. If you ever look into any beginner books or videos or courses on drumming or any instrument for that matter, you'll run across this phrase. Learning something new, especially something that involves your body doing something it's not used to doing, it's gonna take some time. Looking back on my early drumming days, it's easy to say that I took this advice to heart, but to be honest, I'm not sure if I really thought about this phrase and took it seriously. I constantly compared myself to my peers, attempted to practice complicated stuff instead of playing simple things well, and developed a few bad habits. There's so much value in truly understanding the simple things that you're playing. And to that point, I can say that that's where a lot of the fun for my earlier drum days came from. Playing along to pavement records, the white stripes, the strokes, made learning how to perform in pocket really fun. Contrasting that experience to playing something that's super fancy or complicated or squeezing in a feel that doesn't necessarily fit just to impress folks with more experience than me. Like it's great to be inspired by things, but prioritizing sounding good to the songs that I was playing along to, mainly the songs I was practicing, really improved my tempo and made me more dependable when I was playing with other people. It's Not A Race also applies to how I felt about practicing. What I learned from making so many of these videos is the slowing down of the parts or the drum groups that I didn't necessarily know how to play, but I'm still learning how to play and taking my time learning how the pieces fit together. It scratches a very special part of my brain, to be honest. And knowing that when I leave the studio or I leave that practice session, I might not understand the groove or get it perfectly this day, not even in a week, but eventually it all come together. And also being in community with other drummers can bring a level of anxiety to your playing where you're super aware of what you can't do and you're attempting to play catch up. A good way of working around that is just ask more questions. But that has to do with the next thing I learned. So this can come across as a little reductive, but what it means is that the feeling behind notes and how you play them is more important than how complex something can be, in my opinion. And it's not just about chops. Chops. There are so many nuances in how certain players hit the snare. hi-hat notes are opened and closed. Now we're doing or even the uniformity in how the hi-hat is played. feel, and more importantly, groove, lends itself to a certain level of comfortability, a confidence that really inspires how the song moves and works. And yes, that takes chops. 
or a level of physical competency that comes with experience. So upon a shallow examination, the groove might seem simple, but the pieces and how they operate are more complex. And at that point, I feel like the drummer operates as the chief songwriter. So much of the feel informs the, the mood, the vibe, the dance of the song. The drum feels or the complex parts of the songs are usually a bonus. And they deserve their space for sure. But as a songwriter, just remember that the whole song has to sound good. And you have to be able to play it, like, all the time. Or dependably. And one thing about me, I'm not necessarily a chops hater. Chops. But I am slightly annoyed when I hear drummers chop over the other instruments in the song. Like, as if they're taking more space than needed. Which is why you should always... So many, so many, literally so many times I've been at shows where the drummer was just too loud. And I get it, like, hit them hard. But again, think about it. Like, sure, a band is only as good as its drummer, but that doesn't mean that you're the only person that the folks want to hear. Feel and groove involve a self-awareness of your volume. And volume control involves knowing how acoustic drums work. For the most part, you don't necessarily need to hit the cymbals that hard. They tend to carry higher frequencies, so the more precise you are with them, the better in regards to which area of the cymbals you need to hit when and where. And as long as you're consistent with your hits, and consistency with those hits outranks the bashiness of it all. And as always, there are caveats and dynamics, for sure. The snare should match the feel of the song. If you're with a softy singer-songwriter, you really shouldn't need to bash the cymbal that hard, unless they ask for it. And, in general, toms carry lower frequencies, so they can be hit harder. Knowing these dynamics and how to mix them can really help you stand out, as a drummer specifically. What's most important in your playing is one, that it's consistent, and two, that the sound is appropriate. Being too loud or too quiet can take away from the energy of a song. So how do you find that sweet spot? I personally record myself playing pretty often, and from the videos I watch and listen back to, I have a pretty good idea of how I'm sounding. That plus looking at hundreds of squiggly bars in my recording software, which is good to have because your DAW usually can highlight which specific tracks are too loud or too quiet, which can give me a heads up. But using your phone is fine too. If you're looking to be a gigging drummer, you're gonna have to play in a diverse number of rooms, most of which are gonna change how your drums sound. It doesn't matter how much you tune or adjust, different rooms are different. That added, the changes that occur when there are a lot of bodies in the room. And with that, you have to mix yourself in regards to which parts need to be louder or quieter. Building that presence of mind where you're both listening to yourself and the other instruments, is, which is why and there seems to be this combo centering around chops, chops involving some of the more popular drummers so many of them are just so incredible to watch and it's easy to get caught up in the chops and the, the style that they've developed or a solo that they've played. But what I've noticed is how well most of these players listen to and respond to who they're playing with. I recently had the opportunity to see Nate Smith and Kenfo, and here's a good example of this. There's also numerous examples of this happening with Yusuf Days and Charlie Stacy. What I love about these clips is that they truly highlight the importance of listening and allowing space to readjust. There have been so many times where I go to a part that will be rehearsed to play as planned and something happens. Maybe someone's equipment shorts out and I need to quickly shift 
maybe take out or add some notes or take the song in a totally different direction. And a lot of times you might just need to stall for time. There was a gig I had last year where we had hired a sub for one of the festivals we were playing. And after a quick section rehearsal with the other horn player, the day of the gig arrives and we literally hit the stage with this person nowhere to be found. We're all on stage waiting and with festivals you can't really go over your time. So the guitarists start playing something on the spot and it was my job to follow him. And thankfully this bought us a lot of time. And I'm sure there will be other times where someone's equipment malfunctions or someone breaks a string and the part that you usually go to can't happen. Do you stop playing or do you keep going? A lot of the time you just have to keep going. The show must go on as they say. And as a drummer, those moments can be a true test of your feel and your groove and your understanding of how the song works. It can also be an opportunity for you to solo. One thing I love about the competency and control of drumming is the more room you make for your bandmates and other musicians, the more room you also make for yourself. You can challenge yourself to play off of what you hear and see what you can do in between sections and bars. But in addition to that, you add an extraordinary amount of value to what you're playing and what the audience hears overall. And if you sound good and you make other people sound good, you get that callback, your band gets that more prolific gig, you get that write-up, and generally you go further. Unless you're some chopped up prodigy, it's important to understand that the songs and show doesn't necessarily revolve around you. Well, it does and it doesn't. Like you being consistent and audible is important, but folks want to hear everyone, which is why you should... So if I ask you who your favorite drummer is, if you're an older person, you might say Buddy Rich, Max Roach, Elvin Jones. If you ignore jazz completely, you might say like a John Bonham or Neil Peart or even Travis Barker. Maybe you're a contemporary jazz head and you love J.D. Beck, Mark Giuliano, or Yusef Days. I'm just gonna list drummers for the rest of the video. However, when I think about some of my favorite drum tracks and reflect on how these songs have inspired me, like specific songs that hold a lot of emotional weight, I think of drummers like Chris Bear, D'Antoni Parks, Makaya McRaven, or Tom Skinner. Building specific soundscapes and using a medium to slow tempo to add to and to fill space intentionally shows such a developed ear and a creative spirit that I personally resonate with. And I aspire to cultivate that. The precious and small amount of notes are definitely appreciated and greatly felt because they are the things that shape the song, specifically with these songs. What clicked from hearing these songs for me specifically is the need to start simple with like with a simple idea build something new off of it and find a way to shape the song with your own voice in addition to being connected to all the drummers that inspire you you have the opportunity to kind of make your own sound your own style your own feel and that can be felt by the people that you're playing with when you see yourself as a songwriter even though music law doesn't and by prioritizing adding and subtracting certain parts of your playing or restricting intensity from certain parts of the song, you can build a musical language or way of communicating that goes outside of verse, hi-hat, chorus, ride. And with that, playing becomes more engaging and more fun. Writing can be more intense and personal, challenging even. And, you know, just a disclaimer, off rip, good drumming doesn't mean that the song is good. And with that, So yada yada, music industry, very difficult. Everybody wants a drummer. Few people can afford a drummer. You can only be at one place at a time and opportunities are hard to come by, even for the best of us. You can be as talented as you want to be, the best player, most chops, know all of the different grooves and styles from around the world. But if you suck to be around, folks aren't going to want to hang with you or make music with you and at best hire you. If you can't keep a schedule, show up on time, remember the songs, whatever, it's 
going to be hard for you to find opportunities that gel and work out for you in the long run. And even if you are fucking awesome at drumming and kind and nice, you'll still need to know how to market yourself. Maybe learn how to make content and videos like this to put yourself out there and make it look nice. Don't half-ass it. And then after that, once you get hired, do you know how to advocate for yourself? Do you know how to make sure that you're paid fairly? Do you know how to even work to that goal or other goals that you want to get other opportunities or even where to start? These questions are important because it's very crucial to be in conversation with what you want. And it's okay if these goals shift or change. But being in conversation with what you want requires a level of forethought and planning and possibly you gaining some new skills that aren't related to drumming at all. It can be hard to navigate these questions. So a good place to start is to remember that I said at the beginning of this video, I started drumming about 10 years ago. Thankfully, in my community, there was an open mic that could facilitate a full band. I got to listen to and see and meet and talk to a variety of different drummers and see them play in a bunch of different styles. Eventually, the regulars became my friends and they would share tips. But more importantly, they offered me insight in how my local music landscape worked. A better understanding of the local bars that had live music. A better understanding of venues and festivals that booked local talent. From there, I went to more shows that feature local bands, made friends there, and the network of people that I knew that participated in my local music scene grew exponentially so. So that's why I say invest a lot of time exploring your local music scene. I'm sure there are people in your neighborhood, in your community that want to create and work towards these creative goals with you. Community also connects you to the ecosystem of people who are looking for artists to support and build with. New friends, people to shoot shit with, and drink. Having these folks in my life made the effort of putting myself out there and going to shows seem slightly effortless because I was just hanging with friends. Sure, I was practicing and playing a lot, but my community truly inspired me and made me want to do more, show up more, create more. And a quick disclaimer, with community comes inter-community harm. As musicians, be it amateur or professional, it is important to keep your peers accountable for the harm that they cause. Musicians have this stinky habit of protecting abusers, and we aren't tolerating that anymore. I'm hoping that the connections that you make ground you and align you with the love and support that you need. Whether you want to tour eventually, travel with your music, or just play gigs on the weekend, the communal aspect of music and drumming literally goes back millennia and is a center point in how you build creatively. It should also center your understanding and your internal timekeeping instincts because live music is live. And your solo practice and playing live really help build that timekeeping natural skill that you're looking to focus on. And playing with others regularly really sharpens those instincts as well. It makes it easier for you to react. And it helps you develop a communicative style while you're playing. Like how you interact with folks in the moment, non-verbally. It's a collection of small things. Making eye contact as parts switch up between bridges, building and releasing tension in parts of the song, the organic life of a live set or an improvisational set can bring so much enjoyment and spirituality out of your playing. These moments have really helped me figure out who I am and dig deeper into the artist and performer that I want to be. If you're willing to let that guide you with an open ear, these experiences will be really rewarding. But for the most part, due to the competitive nature of finding gigs or just trying to make a living while pursuing something you're passionate about, it's important to remember I am not rich, let alone stable from doing this right now. But with my exploration of performance and doing this, and with some amount of luck, I have been able to travel the world playing music. With that said, it's very difficult to make money doing this. Be it a hobby or a dedicated career path, you kind of have to make sure that you really love doing this and maintain the level of joy that you get from performing. That connection has to be intrinsic and feed into you. And from what I feel... An easy way to kind of dig into that is to keep your ear open to the many different types of music 
and the diverse amount of styles that there are. And keeping my ear open to how vast and unending the amount of learning I can do could possibly be. Always striving to learn new styles, grooves, genres, ways of approaching it can make falling in love with drumming consistently super easy. Curiosity in what I listen to and how I'm listening easily keeps me trying new things, but it also connects you to different cultures and parts of the world and their stories. And with that, it greatly impacts your perspective as a person. Whether we're talking about the aesthetics of post-bop jazz, the limitless control of the Afrobeat greats, the multi-limbed independence that is needed to play Afro-Caribbean music, basically anything from the African diaspora, you can see or patch together a really intricate web of how rhythm informs dance, how dance informs celebration, achievement, or grief, and how those things inform culture. And once that world opens up for you, practicing and building those styles into your practice becomes so much easier. And that comes from a solid love and appreciation for this. But in able to get there, you have to So let's get this out the way. Yes, you should be wearing ear protection. Tinnitus after a loud show, performance, or practice can be viewed as common, but just like any other part of the body that isn't taken care of, after a while, the sharpness, clarity, or definition of that part of the body begins to degrade. Your ear as a musician is one of your most important assets. It's how you make discerning decisions while you play, and it's critical that you keep it as sharp as you can for as long as you can. With that said, it's important to acknowledge that there are other drummers who still perform with limited hearing capacity, and they're still fantastic. The main purpose of this section is for you to treat ear care as a serious matter and err on the side of caution when loud noises are involved. That said, developing your ear while protecting it leans back into a few things that we've also talked about. Listening to a plethora of different artists and sounds and picking apart individual instruments in the mix while you're listening can really enhance your listening experience. It can also inspire you creatively. Subtle nuances in the instrumentation are so important in regards to how one fills the space and can inform how you interpret the time of the song you're playing or listening to. Being able to tune into frequencies or even different pieces of the kit while I'm playing and listening helped me develop a certain dance around the kit specifically. Like once I was able to develop and hear the specific sounds I wanted to make, a snare hit or a rim shot, a hi-hat hit or feel, whether or not it swings, that's when I'm able to lean in and then my playing becomes more effortless or like I'm dancing. And that dance starts with my ear, singling out certain parts to embellish and subtracting from others. A good way to start training your ears to listen to older, quieter music. I find that older records, like this one, for example, the dynamics of the instruments had a very textural feel. And through listening to this record all the way through, I gained a greater appreciation of the moments created by the musicians and how specific players transitioned between phrases. There's also a great mix of quiet and loud songs on this record, so I'd say give it a listen, which is why I highly recommend it. Here's a list of other records that helped me develop my ear. I'd love to go over them now, but that'd be a whole different video. If you'd like for me to talk about them, I'd say just leave me a long when to comment. I'm always interested in seeing what kind of content I should make for this channel. But even with a great ear, solid feel, good amount of practice, and all the talent and support, performing can be difficult, daunting even, which is why I have to Performing is as much a mental feat as it is a physical one, if that makes sense. Stage fright, nervousness, 
butterflies in the stomach all happen. And it's important to ground yourself. I mean, what's the point of practicing all the time if you can't play it live, right? So how does one mentally prepare to perform? Well, I can only speak for myself. So this is how I go about it. Being on time, not rushed for setup, sound check, call time, whatever seems to ease my anxiety. Shows are usually chaotic. The stage crew or sound person is usually doing five to six things at the same time. So just by showing up on time, you make things easier for everybody. This also gives you time to set up your kit in a way that's most comfortable for you. I think I made a video about that. Now, there won't always be time where you can comfortably set up, which leads to another part of my pre-show ritual, which is a rudiment warm-up. Tons of these on YouTube, Dromeo, whatever. Just I typically use a cushion chair and just go through all my rudiments for about 10 to 15 minutes. Have one or two drinks to loosen up because I'm grown. Also, do not drink too much before your set. And if you have trouble with that, personally, I suggest not drinking at all. After that, I have a decent amount of water, not too much. Uh, and I also make sure to eat about two hours before I have to play. And typically, not a lot of food either. Enough to have some energy, but not enough to feel sluggish. Oftentimes, I have to use a backline kit, which can be a hassle. So I bring all the breakables that make me feel comfortable. My seat height is very important, so I bring my own throne. I bring my own snare because it's a snare and it's cute, my own cymbals because cymbals, and my own kick pedal because again, it's important to feel comfortable and your feet are doing a lot of work during shows. Lastly, I tend to bring my own hi-hat clutch because that's something that usually isn't provided with backline sometimes. It's really strange, like a 50-50 chance that they won't have a clutch for you. I don't know why. And also, like, your clutch has a specific feel too, so it helps a lot with your comfort. And that's basically it. While playing, I'm mostly focused on listening to my bandmates and just having a good time. I don't necessarily think about how I'm perceived while I'm playing that often. So much of my energy is spent being in the moment and listening until I get that body high that performance gives me. That's about it. 10 things I've learned from 10 years of doing this. Do you want more information about touring? More information about navigating your local music scene? Anything really, just sound off below. Also, I want to thank everyone for all the support. These past couple months have been super rough for me, and knowing that everyone has just been really kind and gracious has been really important to me. I'm going to have more stuff up soon, mostly talking about music and its relation to drumming, possibly, and I'm really excited for everything that I'm working on. Also, I am going on tour in July. I'll put the dates here, and I just want to thank everyone for helping me out. And lastly, if you would like access to exclusive content, drums only audio of the tracks I played on this channel, or if you just want to support me in general, consider joining my Patreon. There's so much up already. I have a bunch of live footage from shows I've played recently, but yeah, tons of perks and it really helps me buy food and pay bills. So yeah, see you on tour soon. Join my Patreon if you want to support the channel and let me know what you'd like to hear me talk about in the future. Thanks. Bye.